Before this review gets underway, I want to say thank you to all of you who decided to show up for this. I know this review is very late, and because of that, it is going to suffer in terms of views. But if you like what you see, please do whatever you can to help it out. Give it a share, tell a buddy, leave a like, leave a comment, do whatever you guys do. It will be greatly appreciated. But with that, I'm not going to waste any more of your time. Let's get into the Yakuza Like a Dragon review. Having recently celebrated its 15 year anniversary, Sega's Yakuza series has had a long and tumultuous journey to gain the international notoriety it deserves. Though its popularity in Japan has been strong enough since its inception to have film and stage play adaptations, it really only caught on in the West following the release of Yakuza 0. Though a sleeper hit at first, Yakuza 0 became such a sensation that over the next couple years we've seen remakes of Yakuza 1 and 2, remasters of Yakuza 3 through 5, and the canonical end to the Kiryu Cosma saga, Yakuza 6, all releasing on PlayStation 4, giving the series a new home where the entire saga could be played and supported. With the West finally on board and caught up and primed to understand and enjoy this brawler series to its fullest extent, RGG Studios done something wild and rather unexpected. Dropping the brawler combat for more traditional turn-based party and job class driven JRPG combat, moving from from the familiar Kamurocho to a fictional recreation of Yokohama called Yokohama, and moving on from the much beloved main character Kiryu Kazuma to an all new character named Ichiban Kasuga, they made fundamental and deep changes that could very easily cause a split in the fan base. This was a huge risk on Sega and RGG's part that there was no way to tell how it would be received. And with this being the team's first attempt at a game in this style, it's easy to see how it could go wrong. But I'm here to tell you that if you have any reservations at all, cast them aside, because RGG absolutely knocked this one out of the park. Not only is this a great first attempt at making a turn-based RPG, but it's so strong that it can easily put some genre developer veterans to shame. But the reason I bring this up here isn't just to tell you to have faith but because this risk to everything they've been building, this risk to forge a new path in a new direction, is absolutely relevant to the main themes of the game. Yakuza Like a Dragon's very existence parallels and strengthens the themes of the game in ways very few works of media have ever accomplished. Hopefully all of that will make a little bit more sense as I get into it more later, but for now, let's take a look at our new characters, our new world, and our new story and maybe some of the other stuff you'll be doing along the way. If there's one thing that hasn't changed at all from past centuries, it is the storytelling, and thankfully so. Though much of the game feels different, they waste no time in helping you realize there's still that familiar sense of Yakuza you've come to know and love to ease you into this new type of experience. The story begins with a prologue set about 20 years prior to the main event. In a chance meeting, our young protagonist Ichiban Kasuga meets the Arakawa family patriarch. This meeting is a turning point in Ichiban's life, where Ichiban, a rather misguided youth, with perhaps not the best or most traditional social supports around, seeks to join the Arakawa family and adopt the traditional Yakuza mentalities he witnessed and respected in the Arakawa family's patriarch. Though he succeeds at joining the family, his dedication to his patriarch sends his life off the rails pretty quickly, when a series of events lands him in a prison cell for 18 years. Undeterred and with steadfast dedication, Ichiban plans to reintegrate with the Yakuza family upon release, but he discovers the hard way that that 18 years is a lot longer than he realized, and during his time on the inside, the world went and got itself in a real hurry. Upon release, the world is not at all what he thought it would be. The family he left behind is not the family he's returning to. The Arakawa patriarch who once took him in and guided him now seems to be everything Ichiban once resented about modern Yakuza, leaving him out on the streets with nowhere to go. And thus begins our journey. On the grimy streets of Yokohama, Ichiban finds himself broke, alone, and penniless, needing to work himself up out of the life of a cardboard box and back into the Yakuza lifestyle he's so respected. Or I say penniless, but he is left with one dangling carrot to chase. After a rough encounter that left Ichiban nearly dead, somebody had snuck a bill into his coat pocket. A bill that due to a chance misprint shows very obvious signs of what could be a massive ongoing counterfeit
counterfeit money operation. But it's here at the bottom of the food chain we run into that theme I mentioned earlier. Themes of great sacrifices and new beginnings. Themes that bring a message anybody can learn from. No matter where you are in life, how deep in the dirt you've got yourself, or whether or not you are unhappy or ill-content with what you're doing, it's never too late to start over. Take responsibility for the life you've lived and the lifestyle you've created. Prune the rotten fruit from the branches or tear the whole tree out by the roots. Now it's one thing to hear characters tout these platitudes or watch the fictional representation of them that the game provides, but it's another to see the proof of these platitudes right there in your very hands. Yakuza Like a Dragon is a true-to-life example of the message it preaches and it's all the stronger because of it. Now, there's not just this singular theme, of course. Like a Dragon also relies on some series staple themes, exploring unorthodox family dynamics, honor, and tradition versus modernity. We also explore in great detail how publicly shunned or outlawed work provides much needed opportunities for those in tough situations. But it's not all sunshine and roses. It is very gray about these things, showing also the trouble that comes with the territory. With certain sub-stories, recurring themes of environmentalism also pop up. With the exception of one or two brief moments, Yakuza Like a Dragon tells a wonderful, unpredictable, and heartfelt tale with razor-sharp precision and pace. Uh, the sub-stories cover a lot of ground and offer up some of the game's most memorable moments, with some even rewarding you with new pound mates, characters and creatures you can summon into battle. The regular affair of minigames are here and accounted for, from Shoji to Mahjong, the Sega Arcade, Darts, and Karaoke, though we do have a few fun new ones. Ichiban can take up bicycle back bottle collecting as a way of making money. This kind of works like a Mario Kart battle arena meets Pac-Man, and I found it quite enjoyable despite the bike seeming intentional unwieldy. And sticking with the Mario Kart theme, we have Dragon Kart, a large kart racing competition with several interwoven sub-stories. This at first felt a little tough to control, but over time I came to enjoy it. And at the very least, it was a better racer than Kandagawa Jet Girls, so let that say what it will. We also have a new minigame where Ichiban becomes the manager of a small confectionery shop, and from here we need to climb the ranks of business in Yokohama. This involves buying, selling, and upgrading businesses, hiring, training, motivating, and promoting new employees, as well as making sure you have them hired on to work in the right shops. Every few business cycles you need to attend shareholder meetings. The higher your profit margins are and the happier your employees are, the better chances you'll have to impress your investors and climb company ranks faster. Overall, this minigame probably took me about 8 hours to complete, but it may have taken me longer than it took others, having lost an investor meeting so bad early on that I actually dropped about 40 ranks at once. I really enjoyed this and the number crunching aspects of it all, but the last 20 ranks or so did get really tedious. In addition to this, we also have Part Time Hero, which is kind of like your job board for fetch quests, gathering quests, and special combat quests. I didn't care for this all that much, but I did every fight that I seen on the map and turned in whatever else I completed naturally. It's a good way to make money and gain more experience, but not much else. Overall, there's plenty to keep you entertained. Now, I did mention there was a small pacing issue or two in the game, and these all come in the back quarter. Once you hit chapter 12, they take a couple missteps. To start off, the chapter begins by requiring the player to amass several millions of yen to progress. Naturally, as I do most of the side content in these games, I already had this ready. But not everybody plays like I do, and at this point, progression becomes walled behind a dollar sign. The game recommends you work on side quests to make the cash, but then that makes the side content required. I've complained about this sort of thing in other games, and though it didn't halt me here, I'd still consider it a major issue to present stuff as side content when it is in fact required. Difficulty spikes also become a little more common after this, and if you haven't been using the job classes the game specifically wants you to use without telling you, you may find yourself hitting a couple grind walls. This is unfortunately incredibly evident in one of the final battles where a boss has an instant KO attack. Yakuza Like a Dragon is one of those 
RPGs where if your main character dies, it is game over. Luckily, Ichiban can get a skill that allows him to withstand insta-kill attacks, but only if you've been using a specific job class. A job class I personally was not using, and as a result, the chances of me winning this late game battle came down to luck. I simply needed this boss to not target Ichiban with that attack so that I could win. It took four tries and about an hour and a half, but I eventually pulled it off. So yeah, there is a couple missteps that can cause your progress to come to a sudden halt, if you've not been playing right. Though everything in this game is presented as if there is no right way to be playing. It can be a rude awakening, but at 70 hours, about 30 to 35 of which was made of main story, it wasn't enough to hamper my experience. Like any Yakuza game, this has a lot to say, and Ichiban is a great new main character to get these themes and messages across with. Though he's about 40 years old during the bulk of the game, a lot of his mentality feels stuck in adolescence. He is a lovable goofball, but he suffers a rather quick temper, and though he's learned the values of action and respect, the values of inaction and blind loyalty has yet to dawn on him. This gives him a good deal of room to develop as a character over the course of the adventure, which I'm happy to say he, along with most other cast members, does an exceptional well job of. Nanba, like Ichiban, has a bit of a goofy streak, but he suffers a bit of self-worth issues, and he likes to keep his past closely guarded. Adachi is probably my favorite party member outside of Ichiban. He just gives off those warm working class dad vibes, but he's somebody who holds on to guilt very strongly and does his best to make sure others don't suffer as victims of injustice. By the end of the game, you'll have a good handful of party members to choose from, but I'm gonna leave it up to you to discover what makes them them. As a cast, the chemistry here is legit, aside from one optional character who, because they're optional, doesn't actually interact with the other cast members in any cutscenes. There is optional social events, which which allow you to get to know your characters on a deeper level and explore what's going on in their life outside of their involvement with you in the main story. And these optional events contain some great stories that really flesh them out. The more of these you see, the more you rank up their social levels, allowing them to gain more XP when not in active combat. This will also expand their combat abilities while you have them active. So, since we're kind of already on the topic, let's take a look at the combat. The biggest and possibly most controversial change in Yakuza Like a Dragon. Keeping in the idea of the game itself being some out of universe or meta sort of proof of its themes, the combat here is more than just a stylistic choice, but one that plays into our main character's worldview and works to two ends. In the world of the Yakuza, a dragon is a sort of rank or a representation of the type of Yakuza somebody is, often marked by the tattoos they carry on their back. Ichiban Kasuka seeks to be something like a dragon, hence the title. However, Kasuka was also a big fan of the Dragon Quest games as many Japanese youth who grew up in the 80s and 90s were, something I'm sure even some of the fellow kids in my audience find hashtag relatable. To this end, he models himself partially after the noble heroes who front those games. Likewise, when it comes to combat scenarios, he rationalizes them like Dragon Quest battles, which we as the player see play out in a turn-based fashion, and with all human adversaries taking on a demonic or possessed sort of form. Again, like a dragon, or rather like a Dragon Quest game. For the most part, combat is solid, but not exactly breaking new ground for the genre. You enter battle by encountering mobs of enemies in the overworld, whose level is usually based on their geolocation. Combat occurs in the exact location you encountered the enemies at, and this can lead to some intermittent issues with the design of the zones getting in the way. In rare instances, they might actually require enemies or characters to be teleported out of their problem zones to progress, but it's not too big of an issue. Most of the battle system is standard JRPG stuff. You have your HP and MP and MP is of course used for special attacks which come in a few different forms. Solo attacks, elemental attacks, and tag team attacks where Ichiban and a partner or partners attack the enemy together. There's also the Pound Mates, large, really fun to watch summons that you unlock mostly through side quests. These cost money to utilize and have long cooldown times afterwards, but they are very powerful. Pretty much every special attack in the game is just a treat to witness. It's all so over the top in the best of ways. I mentioned job classes earlier 
earlier. After a certain point in the game, you can freely change your job class. Doing this will reset your job level to one, but open up a whole new world of opportunities. Job levels and character levels are separate, so it's not like you revert to baby stats, but it is certainly a setback. Not all job classes are available at once either. Some require you to level up certain social stats, among other things, to unlock them. Social stats will also open up new side quests or make ongoing ones completable, though annoyingly, they're usually invisible requirements. Some jobs also have special overworld abilities, so it's recommended that you explore them. Though the game is definitely built with the expectation that you'll be sticking to some job classes more than others, but they're not going to tell you which job classes those are. Turn orders are based on speed, you have your items for healing and offensive attacks, a full range of status effects, full weapon and armor equip menus, as well as a crafting station you can fund and upgrade. There is also a semi real time element to combat. When you attack with a special skill, you may have to perform one of two prompts either mashing square if you're on PlayStation or hitting triangle at the opportune moment. When being attacked, you can also hit the action button at the moment of impact to perform a perfect guard and drastically reduce damage. I had a hard time finding the windows for some of these, but this is pretty much exactly the kind of real time element I like in my RPGs, helping your skills and timing feel just as important as your level and stats. There are a couple old school styled JRPG dungeons in the game, mainly sewer dungeons, and I gotta say, this is probably when the game's at its weakest, as the designs here are just thoroughly boring. Just floor after floor of hallways with enemies and little to nothing else to interact with. Thankfully, you'll only encounter these a couple times in the game and they don't usually overstay their welcome, but once or twice they might. That's really the combat in a nutshell. It's not too crazy and aside from a few spikes in difficulty in the latter portions, it's a pretty easy going time. Though it's not all that deep, it has everything I think a turn-based RPG really needs. So much of this was done right that the couple snags I ran into were pretty easily forgivable, which is especially shocking considering it's the team's first attempt. But when you care about quality as much as RGG does, a bit of love, effort, and genuine interest goes a hell of a long ways, EA. So yeah, Yakuza Like a Dragon is a series reset that brings in a new traditional kind of genre combat, but the combat is traditional and rewarding in all of the best ways. It's all done with that over-the-top Yakuza flair too, so it doesn't really feel like you're playing a different series at all. It is true to the tradition of the new genre it's adopting, but it is also remarkably true to the tradition of its own series. It's an incredible effort that can easily appease new and old fans alike, so long as you're a little bit open-minded. But with that, all we have to look at is some technical aspects. We'll start here with the visuals. This is a bit of a wonky area, really. Despite being the newest entry, I don't feel it's exactly the best looking. For the most part, it looks great, but sometimes textures are really slow to load in, or some things like some NPC clothing just isn't that well textured at all, giving them a sort of PlayStation 2 look. And while most of the game runs really solid, there's areas like the park in the northeast corner of the map that runs noticeably worse. Textures and objects pop in frequently here. Smaller details like grass and collectibles have a very short draw distance, and the frame rate kinda tanks a bit. This is one of the busiest and most packed areas in the game with the longest draw distance, so it makes sense, but it would be nice to see it run a little cleaner. Load times in general are pretty long, and it feels like a lot more things require loading screens than they have before. That said, some things feel rather improved for the engine. In previous games, when a background was out of focus, you would always be able to see a small outline around characters where the background was still completely in focus. It was a little jarring there, but they seem to have smoothed that out pretty well here. Most of the things that I feel are lacking are likely due to them just having to make so many new assets for this game compared to the others. There probably wasn't quite enough time to do everything as well as they would typically like to. Sound effects are all good and the OST is as solid as ever, mostly using a blend between electronica and rock music with the odd track here and there just dripping in that cowboy bebop jazz swagger. The game is voiced in Japanese and English, and though I left it in Japanese as I found it fits the location of the game better, I did immediately upon beating the game check out the final scenes again in English and Man, both casts just really deliver. But really, there's not much else for me to comment on. I had no crashes, no crazy bugs, no performance issues that I thought were so major it should cause hesitation. Overall, this is a very well-rounded product, so where do I land with the game? 
Well, Yakuza Like a Dragon is a complete package with only the smallest amount of growing pains I feel it should overcome and learn from in future titles. Our new main character is just as lovable as the dragon we've left behind, and though he'll never be that dragon, he is certainly a lot like him. If you've been a Yakuza fan leading up to this game and have any interest whatsoever in turn-based RPGs, do not miss Ichiban's incredible debut. If you've never played a Yakuza game before, this is a great place to jump in. Like a Dragon is easily one of the best games of 2020 and one of the best Yakuza titles to date, and I look forward to spending the next 10 years with this goofy mop head of a protagonist. Also, there's just like a lot of really hot people in this game. Like, really, really hot people. It's, it's kinda wild. And that's all I'm going to say on Yakuza Like a Dragon, ladies and gentlemen. Another fantastic experience to come out towards the end of 2020. Now, just as a little bit of a side note here, my favorite games of 2020 video is coming soon. It's gonna be a little bit later than it was last year. Thing is, this was one of a few more games I wanted to complete before I put that list together. I have three more games I want to finish, but only one of them is actually going to get a review. So, uh, here's hoping that they're all bangers. Anyways, folks, if you guys like the video, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you can. Links to all of my socials and my Patreon are in the description below, and as always, folks, thanks for watching.